Ji from uh, Berkeley, um, and then traveled quite a bit, spent some time in Oxford. Uh, he became a, a, a professor at Carnegie Mellon, uh, spent there like almost 10 years, and then moved back to Berkeley, where he's uh, now an associate professor, uh, uh, heading a big group, uh, and he's uh, maybe best known for his work at the interface of computer graphics and computer vision, and for his uh, 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 spearheading all the effort concerned with uh, nearest neighbors uh, in uh, computer vision, and more recently with uh, generative models in computer vision. He's a recipient of multiple prizes. The most recent one is uh, 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 one of the most recent ones is a uh, ICM Computing Award. Is it? Uh, and this is uh, one of the top prizes in computer uh, science. Uh, so, which we congratulate, uh, Alexei, and uh, um, we're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you. Thank you, uh, Victor and, and Ivan and, and the rest of the organizers for inviting me here. I'm very happy to reconnect with the, the greater computer vision community in Russia. Um, so because we have already seen a lot of heavy, heavy math, uh, this is going to be a light talk. This is going to be a dessert. So uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully it will be. And thank you to, to Victor, who already introduced a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh, formulations. I'm gonna. S I skip all these equations, so it will be just pictures. Okay. And of course, the work is really done by by my wonderful group uh, at Berkeley, uh, the students and postdocs who have really amazing. Um, so, life is good in deep land. I'm sure you have heard of the deep network revolution, and it's it's almost like you don't need to design algorithms anymore, right? You basically just, for any given problem, you label some training data, uh, define a cost function, and train neural network, and then you, know, you sell your startup for millions of dollars, right? Um, but um, of course, it's not so simple, because, because the, um, these two steps, the labeling the data and the defining the cost function, they're actually very difficult. Um, labeling data is expensive. You have to have people clicking on millions and millions of uh, uh, images because networks are data hungry. Uh, and also, the objective functions are finicky. Um, objective functions, of course, are what you want the network to do. and you know, usually they're designed by hand, and here it's important to avoid the mistake of King, uh, King Midas. If you remember your Greek mythology, King Midas, he wanted to optimize getting lots of money, and so he asked, his loss function was, make everything I touch turn into gold. So it turned out this was not a very good loss function, because he couldn't eat, he couldn't, uh, you know, he killed his wife by touching her, and so, you know, it, it didn't end up well. And so whenever you're trying to tell, you know, what you, what you want, it's very important to, to be really sure that that's what you actually want. Otherwise, the network will just do it and you will not be happy, okay? And so in my research group, basically what we're trying to do is tricking the computer into doing a lot of this hard work by itself, okay? And I'll just give you a, a bunch of different examples. So first is this idea of uh, self-supervision. And self-supervision, so there is, there, is, there is unsupervised learning, there is supervised learning, and this is kind of in between. And basically, it's using su supervised methods, but using the data as its own supervision, okay? Uh, and we actually, most of you guys probably, how many people have heard of word to vec in text? word to vec Okay, a lot, of, a lot of people. So just very briefly, what you want is you want to have a vector representation for a word. What do you do? You get a huge uh, text uh, corpus, and then you randomly pick a, a, a phrase. Then you take one 
a word from that phrase and then you train a network or train some, some kind of a model to, tran to predict, predict the words that are likely to occur within the context of that word. And so you do this task, this is not a very useful task, but the interesting thing is you, you do this task over and over and over again and you get a representation that turns out to work very, very well for a lot of uh, language problems. And this is an example of self-supervised learning because you don't have to label any data. The data is just random text. You don't have to have any labels. It's only the data. And so our idea was to see if we can do something similar in the visual domain. Uh, this is work of uh, Carl Dorch and, and, and company. So here is the idea. We take an image and we take two patches from it, patch A and patch B. And then we want to solve this completely useless pretext task. Given patch A, where should patch B go? And now I want you guys to, to pretend you're a computer and to see if you can solve this task. Where should the patch B go? Down and? And to the right. Very good. Very good. Now, try to introspect a little bit. In psychology, you're not allowed to introspect, but here it's okay. Why, how did you solve this problem? Exactly. You thought, well, this looks like the top of the bus. This looks like the bottom of the bus. And once I connected to other buses that I have seen before, okay, now it's simple. Now, imagine that you are, you come from some island where you have never seen buses in your entire life. Would you be able to solve this problem? Probably not. And so the idea is the following. We're going to force the computer to solve this completely useless problem and by doing it, the hope is that it will figure out, it will have to figure out what a bus is. So we will try to learn semantics by doing this kind of uh, prediction problem. And that's what we do. We take tons and tons of images. For every image, we pick a, a, a patch. Then we pick a set of eight other patches. And then for any pair of patches, we set up a kind of a classic uh, Siamese network. And then at the top of the network is a standard eight-way classifier. Okay? And then we train this thing for five weeks. Okay? This is a hard problem. It's, uh, it, you know, the loss keeps going down even after, uh, after five weeks. Okay? And then, of course, the interesting thing is, what has it learned? So what we can do is we can, at test time, give it a new patch, and then look at the, at the top level of the, of the representation, the embedding, and see if that embedding is, is meaningful, is interesting. And you know, the simplest way to do it is look at nearest neighbors. Look at what are the closest other patches in a big data set to the, that query Im input patch. And the cool thing is you can see that the other nearest neighbors are also cats, right? Even though at training time, we only trained one image at a time. We never look, made it look across images. And yet it basically discovered automatically correspondence across instances without any supervision, right? So it's, 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 it's a little bit magic, right? Using context, you discover these correspondences. And so that got us really interested in, in this idea of finding correspondences uh, and finding good embeddings without supervision. And of course, this is a, you know, representation learning has a long history and, you know, uh, uh, you know you, there are probably faster ways of doing this. You take an image and you basically want to re reproduce some sort of a code or for that image, hopefully a low dimensional code. And that's your representation. So it's kind of like image to vec, right? And the, the most classical way of doing it is, of course, an autoencoder with your loss being a reconstruction loss. You just basically want to reconstruct exactly that same image you got in. Okay? Now, this is, of course, very famous, works, uh, you know, everybody knows about it. What they, most people don't realize is that actually for norm, for re real data sets, for real images, it doesn't actually work very well. It, it, it's not, and, and other things like a denoising autoencoder also don't work very well. And the reason we think is because this is basically a data compression story. And there is a connection between compression and machine learning, but it's not an exact connection. Because for compression, you really don't care about the test set. You really only need to compress your, your, the, the, the things you're compressing, the training set. 
Whereas in machine learning, it's really all about what you're going to do for at the test time. And so what we proposed is to think of this, make the computer work harder. And instead of just compression, can, it, can we think of it as a prediction problem? And so one way to do this is you take your input data, split it in half, and you try to predict the second half from the first half. Okay? And the, the most classical way of doing this, for example, would be uh, colorization, right? So you take a color image and you split it into chrominance, illuminance, uh, and then you try given luminance to predict chrominance, right? And the nice thing is, once you do that, you get a pretty picture out of all, right? But the more important thing is to hopefully you also learn some good representation in the middle, okay? But of course, once you have good pictures, you want to show the good pictures. So we have Ansel Adams, Yosemite. If people want to go to uh, west of the uh, US, it's beautiful. Uh, some other historic images. There are some failures. The, the hair is definitely not orange enough. Um, there is more instructive failures. Anyone can tell me what, what, is, what are the failures here? The here, here is, there's a more obvious failure. Here, I will flip it again. No? The tongue. The tongue is not actually out, and yet it colored it red. So you think, why would it do that? Well, because we trained on ImageNet data, and in ImageNet data, all the poodles, for some reason, have their tongues out. So this is actually very good news, because what this means is that it's not some low-level colorization thing. It's actually a recognize that this is a poodle, and then try to color it the way poodles are colored. So again, without any pre-training, without any supervision, we're getting something that is kind of getting us to, to semantics. Um, so we can do some you know, deep net e electrophysiology, Pick a, pick a neuron and then display um, you know, what it fires on. And so these are some nice neurons that the graduate students found. Not all of them are like this, but there are some that definitely suggest that there is something that might be going on. But of course, um, uh, the, this, you can't really use this as a representation yet because remember we, we split the input data into, ha into halves, right? So, the representation has only been learned on a half of the data, on the, on, the, on the grayscale. What about the other half? So what we do is we basically do exactly the same thing, but in the reverse, and try to predict from color to grayscale. And then, if you look at it, if you squint a little bit, that's kind of like an autoencoder, right? It's, it's the representation takes an image and predicts an image, but it has to work much, much harder to do this task. And so hopefully it also works better. Okay, so this is, uh, this is our CPR 8, 17 paper. We call it split brain autoencoder. Um, and, you know, we can, ah, I, di I didn't actually explain the, how we're going to look at it. You know, there are, there are numbers in the paper. We're basically going to look at how, uh, how it, um, effective it is at, at predicting uh, 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 image net results uh, by just a little bit of fine tuning. And so here are the comparison between split brain and autoencoder. And you can see that autoencoder basically starts overfitting as it goes up the network and the split brain doesn't. Um, and um, we, this very simple approach seemed to work quite, quite a bit better than uh, a lot of other uh, self-supervised algorithms. But of course, it's still not beating the, the supervised uh, method, which actually uses the image net labels in addition to the image net data. Um, but the hope is that because it's unsupervised, you can use you know, orders of magnitude more data, and so hopefully, eventually, we will beat them as well. But this is definitely still a work in progress. OK, so the second thing, though, is whenever you talk about predictions, you have this question of how to evaluate your predictions. And evaluating predictions in, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a one dimension, in a low dimension, is not that hard. But if you want to evaluate production predictions in terms of pixels, it becomes actually quite a bit harder, right? So here, this is what we are trying to optimize, right? We are trying to find f such that we minimize the, the loss function. So we basically we say, 
the whatever the f of x should be as close as possible to your label y under some some kind of loss right and the loss is standard you know the standard loss would be something like uh, l2 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 distance right well the problem is that l2 loss is not a great loss for these kind of problems and i will show you an example so here is what you what happens if you do colorization with an l2 loss it looks kind of grayish sepia kind of thing right compared to the ground truth so why is that well it's actually very simple to see it's actually co connected to uh, the problems that 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 victor has talked about uh, and yerji also it's l2 really assumes that you have a single bump a single mode but what if you have two modes let's see this bird could be blue or it could be red what would l2 want to do it want to split with the, the difference so it's going to do the, the the average of those two which is going to be right in the middle where all the gray colors live so it's going to make you gray and so a lot of the time when you have when you're using l2 you're basically getting either this kind of gray thing or in other examples you get blurry results again because it's trying to make everyone happy and basically look at the average and l1 is a little bit better for 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 reasons that Dijon has talked about but it still doesn't quite solve the problem and so what we had to do for that algorithm was to do complicated you know change change it from classification to from regression to classification and then introduce introduce some boosting to kind of boost the rare colors you know the it it was a lot of hacking by by the grad student but in the end you know we got something that looks reasonably good even though it's actually quite different from the ground truth so it's kind of you know producing a different mode if you want now every time you have something that's uh, that's done by uh, by you know by hacking you, you you think it's a good idea and then you run it on a new image and it doesn't work so in this image for example the same algorithm you know it it knows it not it needs to be very colorful so it gives you all these color colors in the image even though we would probably better want the the back wall to be just white right so it's kind of it's overshooting and so again this is the the issue with 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 kick binders you have to be very careful what you're wishing for and it, so it would be very nice if we could have a, um, a some sort of like a universal loss for any kind of this image to image uh, we call it image to image translation problems uh, colorization super resolution whatever if we could just have some loss that 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 would work for all of them well, we know one loss that works very well. In fact, that's what the loss that everybody has been using. It's called uh, uh, graduate student descent. You basically, the graduate student iterates until the pi pictures look good. Now, that, of course, is, is hard to op optimize, op operationalize. And so another loss that actually we have been using was a little somewhat similar. And it's, we were using it for colorization to evaluate our results. We gave the results to humans and we asked the humans, we gave them a, a, a picture say, is this a real image or is this an image that has been synthesized, colorized? And then if the humans cannot tell the difference, that means our algorithm is working very well. But this is of course also very expensive because you need to do, go to Amazon Mechanical Turk and then you have to pay money and it's, it takes a long time. And it's also, you cannot back propagate through the, through the users, right? And so this is only for evaluation. But luckily, this same loss can actually be operationalized. And this is the seminal paper by, by uh, Ian Goodfellow and, and, and company that, that uh, Victor has already uh, presented in the morning. Uh, that really is actually the perfect thing for any kind of synthesis, you know, graphics problems. It's exactly doing this. It basically puts in a classifier on top of your result and it's basically say, can you tell the difference between the image that was synthesized and some other sample from, from a distribution of images? Okay? So I'm not going to, I'm, I skip all this on all the equations because, because Vito already showed a beautiful, beautiful explanation. But what, what he was talking about is the kind of the classic GANs which are general adversarial networks. They, you start with a random random vector and you're generating images from scratch so to speak and this is actually it's a very hard problem and I'm, I'm great it's great that uh, so many people are trying to work on it but 
What we're going to do is actually solve a much simpler problem called conditional GANs, right? Because we already have some image and we just want to translate it into some other representation. Turns out that this is a much simpler way of, of, uh, of, of working. It, it, it's, it, a lot of the issues that, that, that are so hard become easier in this setting. Um, so, and again, it's basically, we have our generator. Now we call it G instead of F because G sounds like a generator. So we have a generator G that goes and transfers from, let's say, color to, col to, to uh, from grayscale to color. And then on top of it, we, d we add a discriminator, another network. And that network is going to say, is it real or is it fake? Okay? And so G tries to synthesize fake images that fool D, while D is trying to, to, to detect those fakes. And then you're basically just trying to get uh, those two guys to compete with each other and hopefully good things come out. Okay? Um, now, I skip all the equations, but I want to point out that a conditional GAN has a very nice interpretation that is often people kind of don't, 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 uh, don't quite see right away. Basically, from G's perspective, D is the loss function, right? It's a learned loss function. It's instead of like L1 or L2, it's a loss function that has been learned specifically for G, okay? And, and the nice thing is that that loss function is not, it doesn't, it, it could be global. It can look at the entire image. It doesn't have to look pixel by pixel. And so I really like this interpretations of GANs, that it's basically just providing you a learn a train loss function. So now you don't need to pick up a loss function by, by yourself. You can let the computer do it for you, for a class of problems. Uh, and so we, of course, tried it for the colorization problem. And right out of the box, you know, it just produced some reasonable results. So we were very happy with that. But then we thought, you know, we can put any other data in it as well. So uh, my postdoc, Phil Izola, downloaded uh, maps from Google and also um, satellite images. And then we said, can we predict what a satellite would look like from this map? And there is a result. And it, you know, again, right out of the box, we didn't change anything in the software. Um, this is the ground truth. So you can see that it's a little bit not, not quite sharp enough. But you know, it's, it gets the story. And of course, you can do it the other way as well. We can start with, uh, with a satellite and see if it can predict uh, the output as a, as a map and you know that's perhaps more useful direction. Um, we also can you know do other data sets for example this is the the facade data set from uh, from Zurich I think where they labeled uh, for uh, European facades they label things like balconies and windows and doors and stuff like this and so we say can you translate from here to an image right so given this can we pr fake a hallucinated image and this is a result. And you know, it's not completely realistic. Uh, the d discriminator definitely still wins. Ga in GANs, discriminators basically always win. But, but it's, it's getting there. So here's some more examples of these, uh, of these uh, results. And, and you, know, you can look at it and say, wow, this is, looks so much better than, than your standard GAN outputs. But again, this is, a lot of it is because this is a conditional setting. So it doesn't need to generate anything in the world. It just needs to generate something that co corresponds to this label mask. And even though the label mask is reasonably sparse, it, it makes the problem much, much simpler. Uh, we can turn day into night. We can take edges and hallucinate images. So this is kind of canny edges. And these are the images that it uh, hallucinated. Now, this is maybe not that impressive because canny edges have a lot of information. But then we, we trained on this and we tested it on uh, human sketches from James Hayes' data set. So these are like ch kids drawing sketches. And, you know, it's still doing something reasonable, which is, I was very surprised because I thought that this was a, a very hard task. But it, it's still able to, to do something reasonable. Uh, but, of course, it fails sometimes, although it's, it's nice to look at failures too. Um, and the more interesting thing is that we, um, we posted the paper on archive and we also put it on um, uh, the code on GitHub right away. 
And within a few weeks, magically, all these people started using the code and, um, and doing other things with it. So somebody basically tried to predict depth from images. Uh, but the more interesting things are these other um, what people who are not even computer scientists. They're, they're artists. They're artists who's, who somehow got hold of a NVIDIA GPU. And, um, and they were, they're doing all these really cool uh, demos. So we call it uh, Twitter-driven research because they would just do things and post them on Twitter. And then we just steal those pictures and post, put them in my presentation. So uh, it, it's, it's wonderful. You don't even need to, to work at, at all. Um, so uh, there was another cute little demo that somebody wrote that basically makes, allows you to interactively sketch uh, cats. And so people went a little bit crazy on this. But this is basically what you can do. You can, uh, you can search for edges to cats, and you can, you can try it yourself and, uh, and see how it works. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's OK. It's not, it, somehow the internet really liked this. And just this week, somebody got, um, did the same thing for faces. And I even got uh, Jan LeCun to do one for me for this talk. And um, I'm not sure it's a self-portrait. It's a little bit too thin, but uh, there it is. Um, so, the, um, so far, we have talked about uh, doing this image-to-image -image translation when you have paired training examples. So you had your sketches, and then you have your, your corresponding bags. But there are often cases when you don't have correspondences. Let's say that you have uh, a whole bunch of photos that I took, and then uh, a whole bunch of paintings of Cezanne. Maybe all the paintings of Cezanne. There are not that many. And can we somehow do the same translation, but without the training correspondences? And so, in a way, what we want here, then, is we want this kind of setup. We want to have a generator G that goes from some instance in domain one to something in domain two, right? So in domain Y, it, I, we don't, actually, we don't have to enforce what it is in domain Y. It just needs to be something that the discriminator agrees is in domain Y, OK? Now, this is a very, very beautiful desire. But this maybe is a little bit too much to ask, because I can have G just always spit out the same, uh, the same Cezanne painting all the time. And, and, and D will be perfectly happy, and everything will be fine, right? So we need a little bit more supervision here. But we don't want to use humans. So what do we do? Well, the idea is we are going to make, uh, enforce a cycle consistency. So we are going to say that we are going to train another tra uh, uh, translator, F that is going to go the other way, and then we want them to agree with each other. So how do we do this? So this is a cycle consistency loss that uh, we've been working for a few years, and finally we found something that it really works well on. Um, and the idea here is that we basically set up uh, uh, for any instance in domain X, we, tr uh, we basically uh, translate it into domain Y, it goes somewhere, we don't know where, it's just that we know that it's in domain Y. And then we apply F to see where it lands back in domain X. And there we know that it needs to be close to the original X. So X hat should be close to X if we want it to be cycle consistent. And we do it the same way the other direction. Okay? And so now this dis difference between X and X hat is the loss we're trying to minimize. Okay? Now, again, if you, if you squint a little bit and you look at these things, they're basically autoencoders, right? Each one is an autoencoder with this discriminative supervision in the middle. So it's an autoencoder where the, the middle of the autoencoder is forced to be in the other domain. Okay, so it's, it's actually very, kind of very connected to all, all of that type of work. Okay, so how do we how do we work? So here is a couple of uh, pictures I took in Paris, and um, let's see if we can convert them to Cezanne, and and here they are. And you know this is 
this is something that I, you know, people have seen before, this kind of artistic filters, you know, Prisma, for example. I, I like to think that this is what we are doing a better Cezanne than, than, than other people. I, I particularly point to the clouds. I'm very fond of those clouds. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and the, probably it's because we are able to use all of the Cezannes, not just a single image like standard uh, 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 stylization work. But, you know, people have done this before. What people haven't really been able to do before is go the other way around. So here is a couple of Monet's and this is trying to make it into a photo. Okay, and it's a little bit hard to see, which maybe is a good thing because it's, there are still some artifacts, but, you know, this is something that, that, is, that is, uh, we thought was quite neat. Now, of course, to make this talk very nice, I would have shown you some Cezannes instead of Monet's, but Cezanne doesn't work as well. So there's definitely still things to be improved. But if you look at it a little bit zoomed in, so you can see that the water rate really seems to get pretty well. The sky, it often gets quite well. Um, the trees are, are still a work in progress. So you can see that if you zoom into different parts of the image, you can see that often you get, you get things that, wow, this looks real. But then you look at the full thing, it's like, no, not quite. So I think there's still work to be done here, but, but I think it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, so we can also do other, you know, Van, Van Gogh and, uh, and, and some Japanese uh, stuff. So, you know, this is, you can just run, run wild with your own photos. All the, the cycle GAN uh, is also on GitHub. You can download it and play with it right away. Um, we applied it to other things. So, for example, you know, computer generated images to real images. You want to have your Yandex driving car. You don't want to train it on Moscow streets. You want to train it in simulation. You take uh, Google, you know, uh, the, the Grand Theft Auto as your simulator. But then you, you apply it to real images, doesn't look so, it looks very different, so it doesn't work so well. And so this is what happens if we trans, transfer it using CycleGAN. And, you know, it's, again, not quite uh, there, and, uh, but uh, we're able to get much better performance than just using uh, standard training with, uh, with standard uh, uh, ground theft auto. Uh, and just for fun, we also did it the other way around, and that looks kind of funny. Um, we can also do uh, changes of season, summer to winter, and then winter to summer. Uh, we can do t t turn uh, oranges into apples, and then back again. Uh, we can take horses and turn them into zebras, and the other way around. Notice that the background also changed, and that's to be expected because it never was told what a zebra is. So because zebras ha hang out mostly in, uh, in Africa, it's warmer, so everything looks more yellow. It also kind of realizes that the background needs to be more yellow when it's a zebra than, than it's a horse. Um, we also run it on, on a, in a video, basically just one image at a time, no, no continuity at all, and it seems to work reasonably well, although you can see that the stripes are kind of sliding a little bit. But this is basically no, no spatial continuity at all. And, uh, and even the failure cases are kind of funny. So, uh, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I, have, I have just a little bit of time left. So I'm going to give you a little teaser of another work that just came out that is also trying to use um, uh, self-supervision, but for a completely different problem. So, this is just a little teaser, but go read the paper uh, if you want to know more. Um, so reinforcement learning is what you have heard about with all of these things about computers playing video games, Atari video games, right? So basically, you have the computer play, 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 and then as you know, you, it's trying to optimize a reward, which is like the score of the game, and then it gets better and better and better, and then it beats humans, right? That's the story. But the story here is that this, these rewards are typically very, very dense. So in Atari games, you have access to the score, and the score is always changing. So you always know how to make it better because it's very local, right? Uh, or sometimes people use, like, put little apples in the maze so that you can get a little bit of kind of reward this way. Um, but 
you know, in many domains, rewards are kind of sparse, right? So for example, if you're playing chess, you only get the reward at the very end. Did you win or did you not win, right? That at the very end of the game is when you get your reward. And so reinforcement learning doesn't really work in this kind of domain. More interesting for me, what if you don't actually ever get a reward? Maybe you're just playing with Legos. There is no, there is no desired goal state in Legos. There is no desired outcome. You just want to play. Um, and so that's what we were kind of interested in. And in, in psychology, it's called curiosity. So curiosity is, it's argued, is the intrinsic reward that is, that is employed by us humans to, to kind of uh, bridge the gap between the long-term reward that is eventually maybe coming and, you know, what are you doing right now? And so the idea is to try to use, make an agent use curiosity as well. And this is, has been, uh, this has been looked at in the past uh, a while. And one of the, one of the ways that curiosity is defined is difficulty to predict, right? So the idea is that if you, if you, if you know what's going to happen if you do something, maybe it's not that interesting to do it anymore because you already know the outcome, okay? And so um, the idea would be, for example, for Mario Brothers, if you turn, you play, you know, you, you press the left button and you eventually you figure out that the guy is going to run left, you press right button, it will right, right, up, it's going to jump, down, it's not going to do anything because there is ground. And so after a while, you're basically going to go and get bored with this because you're going to know what's going to happen. You're going to have the prediction. But then when you get something new and say, wait a minute, I cannot go right anymore. I hit right, but I don't go right. And that makes you curious. And so you want to hang out more around this area and see, see what else you can learn about this. And then, and then you can make progress, okay? And so the real, the main key to the paper is that we are, we are doing prediction, but not in pixel space. We are doing prediction in the space of, of latent features that we are using, uh, learning using self-supervision. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to just show you the video um, of Mario using no rewards at all. This is just curiosity. He's just hanging around and playing, playing this level. Okay? Now, of course, the interesting thing is what it's going to do on a new level that it hasn't seen before. So this is kind of, this is a test set. And the nice thing is that often it still makes progress, which in robotics is a rare thing when you can actually test on a test set. But, you know, sometimes it, it's, not, uh, it's not able to do it. Here the level is very different. The black background instead of white, it gets completely confused. But that's okay because in computer vision we know how to do fine tuning. And so we fine tune a little bit. And then it is able to pass a, a lot of this level. Not all of it, but some, you know, long way in this level. Um, and then we can also do this for Doom as well, but I'm not gonna skip that. Okay, so in conclusions, um, the way we, we deal with computers and the way we, we program computers is changing. And so often instead of telling them what to do, instructing them what to do, it's, it, find, it turns out it's, it's easier and works better to, to just tell them, you know, what is it that we want to have done? So kind of going up in a higher level of, of, of desires. And maybe sometimes we don't even want to tell them that. Maybe we just want them to be curious. So thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Можно по русски. Okay, yeah, there. So maybe can I ask the next people to queue closer? Yeah. А, по русски можно, да? 
Thank you very much, Alexei, for a very interesting presentation. I'm not going to lie, I've been reading your article about curiosity, dream and reinforcement learning, and they raise a question about what really happens with the agent if, uh, until a certain point of time in the game, he didn't learn sufficient strategy to overcome some special moment, and he gets stuck, he becomes bored, and he doesn't learn anything else. Can you give some ideas and insights how to overcome these difficult problems. So the question is, when you're doing uh, this curiosity learning, there is this, this annoying problem that if you are trying to do something, if, if, you, if you don't succeed for a long time, you get bored. So for example, when I was learning how to play the guitar, it didn't sound good for a very long time. And so I stopped doing it because it, I stopped being curious about it. And this is exactly what's happening in, in Mario, that in one point it needs to jump by, by hitting the right arrow 12 times in a row, which is actually not, it, not easy to learn. And so it just tries to do it, tries doing it, and then it just basically learns that it's going to fail and it stops being curious. Um, we don't know, actually, how to deal with this. This is um, this this probably the the right answer is some sort of a hierarchical story where the idea is that you are going to you you want to learn some uh, some smaller building blocks that you are curious about and then put them together into kind of a larger uh, uh, hierarchical stuff. So so that's a way to go go long distances without really trying it from scratch. So I think, I think that's really the right direction, but we don't actually know how to do it. So I think it's an open problem. Uh, we have all the, 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 testing, the testing code is already online on GitHub, and we are going to po post the, the training stuff on GitHub, I think, in a couple of weeks. So you guys can all just try, try to see if you can solve this problem. Yes. Your presentation. Can you show us an image with Vladimir Vladimirovich? It's a symbol of our conference, I believe. On the GitHub we have all those pictures. It's wonderful. We always believe that we should show all the data. That's why on the GitHub... Oh, I should talk in English. Um, <laughs> we are. We believe in showing all data to, and to... failures as well as uh, successes. So we should. Uh, we should. Uh, 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 we we posted all of the all of the results with, that we ran out. So like ten thousand images and results are all on, on online. And so um, of course I showed you the nice ones, obviously. And even the failures are kind of nice. There is plenty of images for which it really doesn't work. So this is, this is something that, you know, this is not a solved problem. We are still uh, in, in, in the beginning stages. So, um, yeah, there, there is plenty of work to do. But, well, honestly speaking, I wanted to ask a question related to this. Well, this is clear enough. The thing is that when a person invents an idea, it looks like something that you are showing on the right side of this picture. Yablochkov has invented how to generate the curve, then put a wall from, then a kolb, then then made they made a lamp. Why am I saying that? Things that you are doing right now is a theory of imaging. Why it's not transposed to the space of ideas and uh, bringing up to semantic nucleuses, which makes this uh, soup uh, the main of uh, industrial processes, the idea of industrial clusters and many other things. Simply speaking, if uh, I have developed an idea, I have patented it and fix it on the blockchain, why can't we transpose it to the most applicable spaces and dimensions uh, uh, semantic, as a semantic core? Thank you very much. And possibly even the error ones. 
Okay. Um, it, okay. This is a lot, lot. difficult to translate uh, question, uh, but I think the way I understand it is that it's uh, uh, if it works for images, why can't this type of thing kind of transfer work for a space of ideas, right? Um, I think the main problem is that the space of ideas is not very well. Uh, it, we don't know the representation for the space of ideas. The space of images is. It's a matrix. It's, it's simple. Space of ideas, who knows? So I think once somebody figures out this beautiful you know, vector representation of ideas, probably these kind of methods could be tried. But I think the representation is the hard stuff here. This is, this is all quite easy. I think the representation is, is, is the hard. Yeah. Thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. I want to look at it and watch it and rewatch it once again. When I looked at this picture once again, I've seen that the leg was not repainted. The right arm is not repainted, but the rocks which are in the background, for some re reason, they have been repainted into a tiger or a zebra. So the question is, in the following, can we receive this presentation so that before going to sleep I would watch um, it once again? So is the presentation going to be available and, uh, and, and looking at some, uh, uh, some, uh, some bugs in the, in the failures? Uh, so. The presentation, and I'm not sure if they're recorded or not, but all of the data, is, all of, everything is online. I think if you Google uh, cycle GAN, you should get all the, all the data, all the images are there, and all the, all the failures you can, you can get, have access to. Um, the, remember that this is, as I, as I mentioned in the other example, it doesn't know what a horse is. It doesn't know what a zebra is, right? It's trying to find some correspondence between two domains. So it actually, it's trying to learn the concept of a zebra, right? This is the kind of the self-supervised part. But it doesn't, it's, it might actually not have enough data for that. So it basically probably learns some sort of kind of a zebra-like patterns and horse-like patterns. And so, the fact that you know the, the, the leg here is not colored and the arm here is not colored and the background is colored is probably due to the fact that the texture of those things don't, doesn't look like zebra texture uh, as opposed to actually finding the full animal. So I think that's kind of the, the fundamental thing that you don't actually get the sense, the semantics of the entire object. You just basically, it's still looking at it from kind of a local texture-like properties. Okay, let's have uh, the last question, preferably not about this zebra. Uh, yes. Uh. <laughs> Well, I will ask it in Russian. You just told me, told us about possibly that you didn't have enough data. How much data do you think we need to train well? Uh, Very good question. Uh, about, uh, about how much data do we need to do these things? And here I'm, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you a embarrassing thing. Uh, so this, this data set, for example, So I'm, I have been, данных, my whole career has been about you know, getting more and more data. John has been complaining about this for a long time. I always think that the more data is better. And unfortunately, this does not seem to be the case with GANs. And I don't know if you can understand this as well. This data set, 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 Um, and and when we, uh, for когда other domains, для других доменов, когда мы, например, пытались делать нечто подобное, здесь, потому что мы генерируем изображения сами, используя архитектор, мы можем использовать сколько мы хотим. Выясняется, что после определенной... Other nasty things that happen is that if you train your GAN long enough, it starts w 
it, it becomes worse again, which is again not true for like a standard neural network. So I think GANs are just very fickle at this point and I think we just don't know how to optimize them well. I, I think hopefully a lot of these issues will, uh, will be solved uh, when we figure out how to deal with GANs better. But right now it's, it's a little bit ugly and embarrassing. There may be the very last question. Uh, Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, you have uh, two spaces, space of images uh, and space of photos. And uh, if you have uh, image, you have, uh, uh, or if you have a photo, you have much more data. So you have details, you have uh, more information about places. And when you try to encode from uh, uh, space of photos into image, it is okay. You uh, less um, no gain less data, and when you mm -hmm. try to uh, decode back, you must have uh, some uh, um, equation because amount of data and uh, how you beat this problem uh, in your researches. So it's. It's true that, so it, it's, it's actually even more complicated than that because when you have two domains and the sizes are unequal, even if the sizes are equal, we are also seeing that it's always the case that one domain looks much better than the other. So for example, apples to oranges looks generally much better than oranges to apples. And we think that probably it's because here the cycle assumption is that it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But of course, it doesn't have to be the case, right? It doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. And so I think a lot of this is, is, is an issue with, with, with the diff, do, domains having different amount of information. And it's also, the, the sizes are also part of that issue, I think. So we didn't, we, we usually we use more photos than paintings because we just have more photos. But we found that using you know, maybe more than an order of magnitude more doesn't really, doesn't really work that well. Uh, we are right now looking at uh, trying to pick and choose which of the photos are more likely to work well with, uh, with the images. So ag again, a another little uh, story is that when we started, we, we, we took the Cezanne images and then we translated them into images from uh, ImageNet or Flickr. And the results looked very bad. And then I thought, ah, but I have lots of photographs of France. And since Cezanne was in France, maybe it will be easier. And it, indeed it was. So I think there is a lot to be said for choosing the kind of, even if the two distributions are far, you might want to kind of find the closest, the nearest sides of them. And, and, and do translation in there. That's our hope, but we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't have any results there yet. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, by the way, all the talks are recorded and will be posted online on the uh, event website. And uh, we're proceeding now to our final talk. Our final speaker for today is Sumit Chintala. Smith is the leader researcher at uh, Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Lab in uh, New York. And before that, he worked at uh, Jan Lecun's lab uh, there at MIU. And uh, Smith has done uh, some really nice work on uh, 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 several deep learning aspects, including GANs, for example, the, one of the most robust uh, implementations and kinds of GANs, uh, um, such as Wasserstein GAN. But his uh, contribution uh, to deep learning and computer vision explosion is much more than that. In fact, life is so good in uh, deep land because we have so amazing tools to work and to explore there. And uh, Sumit is a contributor and uh, the uh, one of the main developers of uh, maybe the finest, or one of the finest tools there, Torch and PyTorch. And uh, lots of papers mentioned today in the previous talk. Uh, uh, in uh, other talks today uh, have been implemented using Torch and PyTorch and um, uh, we all uh, love it. 
and it's uh, so nice to have your talk and uh, we're looking forward to hear what's next, what kind of great tools and infrastructure we can get access to soon. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Hi. That was quite an introduction. And Alyosha's talk was so good that I'm embarrassed to present after him because my talk is not going to be as good. Um, however, considering that this is the last talk of the day, one upside is that my talk also has no equations or math. It just has a lot of pretty pictures and some diagrams. Um, all right, so I will be talking um, at a higher level about deep learning as a field and the models that the, the research that we are seeing in deep learning where it's getting integrated into products and I'll talk about how there are certain trends that are appearing in deep learning um, that are growing and how we sort of have to change the way we do research and we, we integrate uh, deep learning into products based on these trends and how uh, we're building tools to uh, cope with this. So uh, my talk will be in three stages. In the first stage, I will g uh, give a, a lot of examples of uh, the latest research in deep learning. Uh, not necessarily from Facebook, but entirely from, from the entire industry. And in the second uh, stage, I will talk about what I call is a dynamic trend uh, in deep learning, and I will get to this, uh, I will get to this in, 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 in some time. The last part, a uh, tiny part, is I will talk about the tools we use when uh, building uh, AI research, building neural networks, and how these tools are starting to be categorized into two kinds of uh, 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 types uh, and uh, what we need to build to enable uh, the future trends of AI research in terms of tooling. All right, so start off. Some examples of uh, AI uh, research and products. Uh, the first slide, obviously, is uh, Facebook stuff. Um, so one of the uh, examples that we've effectively integrated into Facebook itself is when you ac access Facebook from an, a, a, a blind person's interface, that is, they, they browse Facebook, um, but they can't actually see. So when they tap text, uh, they, uh, the text is read out to them. If I tap on uh, uh, some, something there, it says Sunday Night Splurge, and the text is read out to, to the person. However, until recently, only the text was uh, typed, uh, uh, read out, but if you tapped on a picture, it would say a picture, but it wouldn't tell you what is in the picture, and that degrades the experience a lot. Like, you can't know if there's a picture of someone laughing in the park um, or a video of a cat chasing a mouse. I mean, these are things we really enjoy when we're um, browsing any social network. And the fact that blind people can experience them is not nice. So we integrated a tool where now if you tap on the picture, it would actually tell you what is in the picture. It would try to describe to you what the picture contains. And similarly, there's uh, research uh, being developed on not only captioning pictures, but also captioning videos. And this is a very uh, impactful and effective uh, use of AI, and it's also cutting edge research that was deployed to 1.9 billion people. Here's another example. Self-driving cars, they're everywhere. You talk about it, you listen about it. 
Uh, I was even sitting in one of them once. Um, and they, building a self-driving car involves a lot of deep learning research, but also a lot of traditional computer vision uh, and a lot of other things. So the deep learning part of the self-driving cars involves uh, doing stuff like stereo uh, correspondence automatically or uh, uh, detecting lane markings in various uh, lighting conditions, whether it's raining or uh, anything, identifying where the stop signs are, where different speed signs are, and so on. So it's a fairly complicated problem, but there's a lot of progress being made. And one of the core components here is uh, a lot of deep neural networks that, that power these cars. And another very, very effective example is machine translation. You want, right now in this audience, there are many people listening to me as I speak in English, and you get a live translation into Russian. But what if there is no translator there uh, all the time for you uh, that is a human? You, just as an example, I came here to Moscow, and I, I don't speak any Russian. Um, I want to go talk to many people on the street and say hi and uh, know what they do. and. But I can't. I, I have a language barrier. And it's, it's a common problem. Someone today uh, asked me how Russian businesses can interact with the rest of the world, how, how they can do business, and how Facebook can help there. And I said, we will try to solve machine translation so that every person in the world can communicate with every other person without having a language barrier. And the way machine translation has been making strides, improving accuracy in what translation happens, is driven by uh, deep neural networks. Um, and th this is going to be a common occurrence, of course. I'm going to keep repeating deep neural networks and deep learning, because they are everywhere. So in machine translation, you use two kinds of networks. Uh, recurrent neural networks and convolutional neural networks, and they they uh, they basically drive your your uh, all of your machine translation, and everyone uses this Google, Yandex, Facebook, um, and there's a lot of open source code there. Primarily, the way you train uh, these things is that you have you collect a data set, you collect a data set of pairs of sentences, one sentence in English and its corresponding translation in Russian or French. And so you collect pairs of sentences, you collect millions of pairs of sentences, and then you train a neural network to understand how to map one sentence to another. Just like how Alyosha in his previous talk showed how you can map Monet paintings to regular paintings and vice versa. So. The, one of the things that you're going to see in my previous two examples is self-driving cars have a lot of dynamic components. You don't collect a data set beforehand and just use that. You also, the machine has to be uh, making certain decisions at runtime that are new. But for image captioning, we also collect a data set beforehand and we, we what a data set in this case is an image and the corresponding captions that the image might be predicted to be. And then you train a neural network that will take an image and generate a caption. Here's another example. This is the Sharp Mask project. Uh, the, traditionally in uh, computer vision, this is called semantic segmentation. What the task here is that you take an image and then you have to segment out every object in the image separately. So here, for example, there are several zebras in the image on the left. And the 
the system has to accurately segment out each zebra separately. And this is useful in many, many places, the fact that you will have the system. You would want this, let's say, a very simple use case is let you want to build a personal robot, like a home robot. You would want semantic segmentation because you won't want the robot to know where different objects are, how, like which part of their image sensor is seeing which object and so on. It's a fundamental and hard computer vision problem and we're making lots of progress on this problem because of neural networks and the way this works is that you collect a big data set of images and their corresponding uh, segmentation that is made by humans and then you would train a neural network to do the same task. This is um, an even more complicated system uh, of captioning plus segmentation. What you have to do here is you have an image and then for each region in the image you have to describe what is happening in, in that region. And this is called dense captioning. Um, and this is useful especially when you're trying to describe more complex situations where many things are happening in the image or let's say you have a video sequence where different things are happening in different parts of the video. And, uh, and again, similarly, you would uh, take a data set um, of images and their dense captions, which is even more cumbersome to, to collect, and then you would train a neural network to give you um, captions for each, each uh, segment of uh, the image. And some of the applications of the systems I've described uh, are obvious. There are many apps that have integrated this technology. Um, there are apps that will, you can click food and then it will tell you how many calories are there in the food. There are apps that, uh, um, that will um, try to look at your human uh, pose and give you tips and apps that will, you can click any object and then it will tell you where to buy it, how much it costs and so on. And the applications here are obvious. It's, it's technologically augmenting your capabilities just like how uh, it's taking your, say, smartphone to the next level of uh, intelligence. Um, Here's one example that touches upon robotics. Um, so this was a, an animation, but I think I screwed something up, so you don't get to see the animation here. But basically, uh, this is work from uh, folks at OpenAI, where there's a robot that it learns to do a particular task by seeing someone else do the task. So if you have a task of, say, move the red block onto the white block, then it's a simple task. Uh, and you can teach it in many ways. You can build a data set where you, know, you show the robot how to move the red block onto the white block, uh, where the white block is in various positions. Or you can teach the robot how to generally control blocks first and then give it a subtask and so on. But more importantly, the robot has to learn this in an interactive fashion. You can't build a data set beforehand and say, here are ways in which you can um, learn from this static data set. The robot has to learn interactively how to move itself, how to look at itself and see what it means by moving and then, then it can learn tasks. Um, the most impressive thing about this research is that they trained, uh, they have a system where the robot can train itself to do new tasks just by seeing one example of a human doing the same task. So if I have a robot that does, that is my personal home assistant, then I can ask it, I can teach it to do laundry just by showing it how I do laundry and then like every day it will just collect my clothes and go do some laundry. 
Um, of course, this is in its much earlier stages of research than building a home automation robot. But more importantly, the point I was trying to uh, point out is that you cannot collect a data set beforehand to train this robot. You have to teach it interactively. Um, another uh, s uh, direction of research that people have been going into is to make um, machines try to understand relational um, relational concepts like uh, or visual questions and answers. So an example is you have a, a, a small picture there on the right bottom and then there's a question that says are there more cubes than yellow things? And so your system needs to understand what cube is, what yellow is, and what thing is. And you can have similar questions uh, that are more complicated. There's like, is the yellow cube to the right of the purple cylinder? And then you have to understand what right is, what left is. Um, and in this case, having a neural network do understand relational structures, understand how to parse the question and then uh, put it into some kind of program that would uh, get interpreted, all of these things, the neural network itself becomes fairly more complicated than what you have seen in uh, some of the previous presentations. You have a neural network that is essentially a computer program by itself in the sense that it will have to learn how to do control flows like if loops and while loops or for loops um, to basically parse your sentence in some dynamic manner and then put, put the right representation that goes into your uh, neural network that actually processes your visual part of, of this problem. So over here you have your data set is static that is, you, you, you can collect a data set beforehand that has the questions and answers and the images, but your neural network itself is fairly, I would say, dynamic in the sense that it's not just a simple data set that you can, uh, a neural network that, that, that you can uh, just put together as building blocks. Um, Another um, set of line of research that is coming through is memory augmented neural networks. Memory augmented neural networks are neural networks that train themselves to understand and use some external memory. So you can have a neural network that trains itself to, as it gets information, put that information into some memory slots that it controls and then later it would read that memory while doing some other task. This is similar to let's say how you could read some article and then later answer questions uh, about that article by referring to some facts from that article from your memory. And there's a lot of research going on in this direction. I only pointed to some two sets of uh, works. Um, but in this case as well, the model that you build is fairly complicated um, that you can't really see it as some model where you send the input and out comes an output. There's a lot of uh, stuff going on in there that's not just say a simple matrix multiplication or some pointwise function. And I would call this also a, the a, a dynamic nature of the neural network. Um, and uh, some work uh, on adversarial networks has been getting very popular. This is uh, a small example of uh, adversarial networks. Alyosha had given a few more, uh, where you generate um, uh, images. In this case, we generate faces. And then you can also do uh, the, uh, linear algebra on, say, the face representations. And even though 
the adversarial network has never learned what the face is or what competence the face has, it learns these consistent interpretations of how to transform um, face semantics one, one to the other. And Alyosha had talked about his two works, I, what I wanted to highlight. There's been a lot of work on adversarial networks and talking about uh, examples and research of AI today without adversarial networks is not going to be sufficient. Um, because Alyosha covered this, I'm obviously not going to cover this. And here's the zebra example he showed. It also, it doesn't have Putin on it, but um, it's uh, there. Um, lastly, I want to talk about how there's an explosive amount of AI research going on on solving video games. And why do, why do AI researchers try to solve video games? The answer is actually quite simple. Video games serve as a proxy uh, for real world, complicated real world issues. Like Super Mario in itself, for example, um, is not useful if an AI solves Super Mario. But Super Mario represents certain things that are hard for an AI to solve that humans can solve easily. Same with StarCraft or Dota. You have these games that humans are very good at understanding and becoming good. Uh, but if you ask an AI to solve it, it can't because it doesn't know how to play games which, in which the human player uh, can easily do where the situation is you only have partial information. You don't have full information of what the other player is doing. You have, um, you have a lot of actions you can take for every time step. For at each time step, uh, as a player, you can choose one of, say, like 10,000 or 100,000 actions. You can build a new unit, you can move a unit somewhere else, and so on. And just having a large action space, having these uh, imperfect information games, these are all very hard problems that if we built a robot, it would have to solve these things in the real world anyways. So researchers use video games instead as a proxy because you can simulate them, you can uh, control them, you can change them in various ways so that you can make research progress. And of course you can uh, also do even more crazy things. Uh, there's an interface called Universe that was released by OpenAI where you can have neural networks or like any agents just go and interact with the internet. You can have a neural network that can learn how to book a ticket for you by you know, Googling for um, tickets and finding the best prize and then just uh, having your credit card on file and like learn all of this process. And there's a lot of research going on in doing these tasks because there's a lot of interest uh, from the product side as well to build chatbots that will be your personal assistants to, um, to, to automate all these tasks that you do routinely. And what these uh, video games or interacting with the internet are, are again dynamic worlds. Like you don't know ahead of time, um, you don't just construct what the internet is ahead of time. You have to interact with it as you train with it. So concluding my first part of the talk, I showed you a series of applications in AI and I sort of pointed out to you that you get different flavors uh, in, in, uh, in AI. You, you have static data sets, dynamic data sets, you have static models, dynamic models. More, uh, like, more objectively, like to put it in a nicer way, what I mean by the static data sets is that you have a data set that you collect beforehand, you have some model, and you train it on some objective, and you train it, train it, train it, and after it's converged, you take this neural network, you take the weights of the neural network or something, and then you put it in your application, and you essentially deploy it. And whenever new data comes in, 
it goes through this neural network and you get some predictions and you use those predictions in, in your product. And you don't have any learning uh, during your prediction time itself. The dynamic kind of neural networks, just to repeat, um, self-driving cars are one of uh, the examples, uh, you know, visual question answering, uh, memory augmented networks, um, you know, interacting with, say, a dynamic environment like video games. Uh, these are all uh, the dynamic kind of neural networks. And one of the trends we're seeing is that there's more and more of research and products that are being built in this direction. I'm not saying the other, the static kind is going less, but I'm saying there's more and more of dynamic neural networks coming to play. And, and, and as I put it, you can, with dynamic neural networks, like I only talked about um, the dynamic worlds here, but you can also have neural networks that can change their own internal behavior based on what data you get. So for example, you can have a neural network that has this shape. Uh, let's say each of those colored nodes are some layers in your neural network. And when sample one comes in, it has this particular shape. But then when sample two comes in, some part of the neural network decides that it wants to change its structure uh, according to the nature of sample two. And this data dependent change in model structure is what I call dynamic uh, neural networks themselves. You can also have memory augmented neural networks that decide at runtime that they need more memory capacity. So they will just increase the number of layers they have at runtime based on some internal criteria. So the, because we're going in this direction of having to have dynamic neural networks, we also need to empower our researchers and our developers to be able to do these things without, without making it really complicated for them. And my last section of the talk, which I've been personally working on, is how do we build tools that can cope up with this changing trend in AI research. And the, the needs of the tool we need to build are that you need to be able to interoperate easily with the dynamic environment. Um, you need to be able to have the dynamic neural networks themselves that can change their structure based on, say, the kind of data they see. In general, you want to have minimal abstractions. That's just a sign of a good library. And lastly, you want to have your neural networks be fast because everyone is impatient. You want everything to be as fast as possible. Um, on the note of fast, one small uh, thing I wanted to say was that uh, at Facebook, we recently released a, a paper um, that uh, shows, uh, shows you how to train a, a state-of-the-art neural network on ImageNet in just one hour um, compared to this, this is the same task that routinely used to take us two or three weeks. And as researchers, you want to prototype uh, the ideas that you're working on as fast as possible. Um, so it was not always obvious on how to scale this up. And finally, we, um, our, our, my colleagues at, at, at Facebook, uh, they've written a paper uh, talking about how to principally do this and make training really fast. The thing that I skipped in this slide is that it trains in one hour on 256 GPUs, which most people don't have access to. Um, anyways, coming back, we want your tools to be fast as well. Now, there's many frameworks in uh, deep learning 
you, if you're building a product or if you're doing research, you use, you almost use, definitely use one of these tools. Um, and I would say you can categorize these tools into two kinds based on the talk I've given so far. One is static graph frameworks and the second is dynamic graph frameworks. And static graph frameworks, they usually expect you to um, collect a data set beforehand or like if your neural network has any dynamic structure, they want you to unroll it beforehand. What that means is if you have some conditionals or some, some uh, loop variables, you want to pre-specify how long you want to unroll your loop for and so on. And they're slightly harder to build research that uh, of the kind that I said is, is dynamic in nature. So what I've been working on is uh, working on this tool called PyTorch and it's a dynamic graph framework and it's equally fast as uh, the other frameworks and it's one of the most flexible tools uh, that we've tried to build for uh, research and what it is is, is it's, a, it's an ND array library so if you ever use NumPy or if you use uh, MATLAB uh, you can use it as a replacement for that that has GPU capabilities and it has an automatic differentiation engine that um, is very different from the other frameworks and it can support um, crazy models and research um, easily. And as a small example, I'm not going to go through this, but this is side by side of a NumPy program and a PyTorch program and they're basically very, very similar. Um, for the programmers in the audience, um, what PyTorch does in, with, with its Autograd engine is that it, you, you start writing an imperative style of program, you just uh, write your code as, as you go and then in the background what PyTorch is doing is it is building your neural network as you're writing the code uh, uh, in the interpreter and when you are ready to, to train your neural network in the final after you after you've finished building your neural network you just call backward on the last variable and then gradient optimization um, happens automatically and this is my last slide. Um, it's just a cell for people to try the thing I've been working on. And I hope you found my talk useful. And I will take questions. Uh, thank you, Sumit, for your for your talk and for, and for the work you are doing with uh, Torch and uh, PyTorch. I'm actually one of the users of your package. Uh, could you please uh, maybe share with us uh, the next plans for the features you are going to uh, release in, in the next PyTorch uh, stable release? Thank sure. Um, in the next PyTorch version, we're going to be releasing uh, distributed training. So you can train on as many machines as you have, as many GPUs as you have um, across machines. Uh, the second feature we're going to release is uh, doing higher order derivatives. Right now in PyTorch you can only uh, do up to first order derivatives. Um, after, uh, in our next release, and that's going to be happening in a couple of weeks, you will have, you will be able to do arbitrary uh, differentials. Uh, basically you can compute Hessian vector products uh, and so on. 
Um, those are the two main features. In the longer term of, say, three to six months, uh, we are working on aspects of speeding up your dynamic computation uh, by introducing a JIT compiler. So you would write your code as is, but uh, in the background, when it's possible, PyTorch will queue up your computation and accelerate it um, by fusing kernels and so on. So these are the three main features we're working on. Mm -hmm. Next question. The access to the Facebook uh, images, is it possible to use freely or do we need to make some legal uh, agreements, for example, the, the whole set of photos, for example, what you have as a company? Um, to be completely honest, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I haven't read the document uh, that says what the image rights are. I just clicked, I agree. <laughs> So, uh, you should ask someone who's a lawyer. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, there is a question in the back. <laughs> Thank you a lot. Um, you are speaking mainly about narrow AI. But did the paradigm shift for general AI? What is your position about that? Maybe a forecast? Uh, the question, if anyone heard, is I was mainly focusing on narrow AI. And there is the whole uh, question about general AI. In general, <laughs> what, we, what we mean by general AI is that a single AI agent that should be able to do multiple tasks at the same time. That's somewhat intelligent like humans who can adapt to and do new tasks rather than just if it learns to do image recognition, that's not the only task it should be able to do over its lifetimes. I only covered in my, in my, um, in my talk um, applications of AI that are present now that are narrow AI. Agents that only learn to do a particular task. Um, there's a lot of research going on uh, in the direction of general AI. The fundamental problem that people are trying to tackle is what we call catastrophic forgetting. What this is is that uh, your, your neural networks have this property that if they learn a particular task and then they learn a second task, they will forget how to do the first task. So this is a problem when you're trying to have one neural network try to do many different tasks. Um, there is no clear answer or direction on like how we're going to solve catastrophic forgetting, but there's a lot of people trying a lot of creative ideas to try to get around this. Um, because it's super speculative research, I didn't cover it in my task, uh, in my talk. Okay, maybe is there are some final question. Uh, uh, there. Thank you. I would like to ask you a question about: uh, Is it a PyTorch? Is it a low-level framework, or it is high-level like Keras? Uh, what's the difference? Like, for example, uh, as I understand, a low-level uh, framework, for example, it's um, TensorFlow, and Keras is high-level. What is PyTorch? PyTorch is all level. You only have one level that is both low level and high level. Uh, it's, we show that with our design that you don't need to have a low level framework and a high level framework. We just do one framework and do it really well. And you wouldn't need two separate levels. OK, thanks. OK, that is, thanks, Sumit. And, uh, so here with, we would like to 
close this uh, event. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask you to thank all the speakers again. So some of these speakers came from the uh, other side of the world. So especially a great thank for them. Also thank for all of you who came here. So we hope that you learned something new and exciting. And uh, so one more piece of information. So all of the talks which you've seen here, they will be online. So they are probably already online. And uh, so they will be translated. So as we had translation, so they will be in two versions, so in English and, and in Russian. So hope you can enjoy it even more. If you enjoyed it here, you can look at it again. And uh, maybe we'll do it again next year.